I'm still driving. I love the beat, you know, when that comes on, it's loud here in the studio and the mood is on, the vibe is on. It's a sweltering Thursday here in KZN, guys. It is super, super hot. Um, yeah, the garden's not really going to enjoy it. But luckily, early, early, early this morning before sunrise, I got up, watered the garden, so I know it's going to be okay. Guys, we're talking summer tips, what to plant, a whole lot of really good solutions that I want to share with you on how to deal with pesty, pesky critters. I don't know about you, but they've come out in full force like the whole family and every distant relative um, has come to hang out in my garden. And... Uh, yeah, we've got to sort that out, but of course in a responsible manner. Um, I see there are loads of you already online. Um, I'm going to get to you and say good morning because uh, we've got a lot to get through today, guys. We really have. Um, uh, Tracy Pinto, good morning from Summerfelt. Uh, Kerry Lynn from Sunningdale Bloberg. Oh, lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, Chantal Oosthuizen, also from Bloberg. Cindy May, good morning from a hot Durban. You, you must be cooking. Um, Wendy van Nickirk from Cape Town. Uh, Chanel from Table View. James Brody from Sea Point. Maureen, good morning um, from a pretty warm hillcrest. Yeah, roger that, roger that. Uh, Diana, good morning from Westville. Ursula uh, from Kales Rafir in Cape Town. Delia Lloyd on YouTube, morning from Westville. Um, and Tion van Vanderbilt Park. Uh, guys, it's good to have you with us. Um, for those of you that are going to be watching a little bit later and you have just tuned in, good morning to you um, and good evening to you as well. Um, folks, I don't know about you, but we know that things are not all as they should be for the beautiful spring and early summer that we were all hoping for and expecting. We've kind of gone from two days of spring into full-blown summer. Um, and I, I have witnessed this wherever we have gone. Um, currently in South Africa, we were in, in George in the, in the Eastern Cape last week. Um, for those of you that I saw at Builders George, mwah, it was lovely to see you guys. Um, we were also in Constantia Berg in Cape Town. Um, and this weekend, do, 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 we are going back to Bloemfontein, the city of roses. Um, guys, if you haven't yet booked your ticket, you better phone your local builders, phone Builders Warehouse Bloom, and make sure that you get a seat. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I, we haven't been there for like three years. So um, I'm super excited to get back um, into the Rose City. And uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good, going to be good. Um, I see a lot more people. Uh, Pretoria, we need the rain. I know, I know, I know. So nowhere, nowhere. I saw there was a little bit of rain in Bedford View, a little shower. We've had a few spits. Um, I know it sounds terrible, but it's like, almost like the angels are sitting up there just going... I mean, really, all it does is settle the dust that doesn't water my plants. Um, so, so, guys, it's, it, it is a bit hectic. So we've got to, like, get our heads right into the right space and, and use what gardening skills, tools, um, things we can learn. We've got to use those to the best of our knowledge and work around it. We can control a lot of things, but we certainly can't control the weather. Doesn't mean we're not going to garden. Most of us would just implode if we had that thought that we cannot garden. Um, so uh, we're going to continue gardening, but we are going to be a little bit smarter about it, a little bit smarter. Um, so what should we be doing now? What should we be doing now? Folks, a lot of our winter stuff is now over. It's basically fried. Um, the last of my primulas are kind of hanging in there. Um, so those need to get whipped out. Um, they need to get taken out. If your violas and that are still looking okay, and you'll probably find those that are only getting about three hours sunlight early morning or late afternoon, they're probably still doing okay. Mine in the open flower beds where it's full sun all day are really battling. And um, in fact, we just pulled them out earlier this week. So you can judge that um, and see what they're looking like. But a lot of your winter color 
is going to have to go to the compost heap. But that's okay. It's okay because it's bringing on the new season. And there's loads of beautiful summer plants that I am going to share with you today and, and give you some interesting things that may be slightly different that you can also think of planting. When we have this heat, this humidity, um, there are a whole lot of other things that come with it. Um, blink and all of a sudden, pew, weeds. Like, guys, where did you come from? And I never saw your invite. Um, especially when we have taken out our winter colour and we've maybe turned the bed. What we've done is we've brought those weed seeds to the surface. They're obviously getting light and then they're going to germinate. Um, so pay attention to those and if they are still young, when you notice them, if they're still young and they are literally just in flower, they haven't seeded yet, they haven't seeded, they are in flower, just listen to this. All I want you to do is take your garden fork and just turn them into the ground. Just turn them in because you're basically adding a green manure into your soil. Yeah, so that's pretty easy. Yeah, it's way easier than standing there and having to try and remove them all. Um, another quick tip that I can offer is get some newspaper. All right, what you can do is have a bucket of water, dunk that newspaper into some water, take it out like paper mache, lay it over the weeds, put a stone on the corners, and trust me, you go back there three days later, those weeds are goners. They have gone somewhere, either up there or down there. I don't know where weed goes, but they are fried. The other way is to take cardboard boxes. Take cardboard boxes, open them up, lay them down, and also water them a bit, and you can cover them with soil if you don't want to see them. But it works perfectly um, for getting rid of weeds or stopping weeds from germinating in beds, which you might not be ready to plant. You might still be making up your mind as to what to put in there. And hopefully by the end of today, um, I would have kind of covered that for you. Very importantly, of course, is the mulching. Guys, and I go on and on and on about this, and I will be a stuck record forever. But please mulch. We know the temperatures. We're feeling them. We are sweating. It's hot. It's dry. So the bit of water that is there, we have got to mulch. But I'm not going to go into that in huge depth because I've got something to share with you a little bit later um, this morning, which is going to give you the complete lowdown on it. Um, so let's get into the planting. Let's get into the planting because there's so much, so, so, so much. And I'm going to start with the bedding plants. Um, I'm going to start with our bedding plants, what we know as little seedlings, all right? So, guys, here are some, and I'm going to grab these as well, um, because this is, where, this is where it all happens, hey? This is where it all happens, and uh, truly, the color that, that these plants can offer, and I'm talking extended, much like we planted our violas in March, April, April. So let's say April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Six months. We forget that. Six months of color they gave us. Six months of color these will also give you. Going into different parts of the garden, plan it carefully. Of course, we can now safely plant impatience. Impatience or impatience, as some of you say. Um, the impatience that are around now, guys, and the ones that you'll find at your local builders are all a variety called beacon, okay? Now, the beacon varieties have been put through their paces. They've been bred, tested in Europe, tested in the Americas, and were available to us probably for the last year and a half, two years. Because remember, all our impatience just like, they went pop. They just... <clears throat> like just fell into the garden. They literally did. They were like, they got that mildew and they just disappeared. And a lot of you have been a bit nervous to plant them, but please don't be nervous. Uh, the beacons are available in all sorts of colors, from this beautiful ready orange to your white. Um, of course, there's the lovely pinks as well. So if it's a semi-shaded spot, okay, semi-shade, avoid planting these in the full sun, guys, because you are going to spend your time watering, watering, watering. So semi-shaded spot, way better for them, absolutely better. Talking of semi-shade, I'm going to show you the other options whilst we are here. 
beautiful begonias. Okay. These are the annual begonias. And you know, some people treat them. And if you do treat them well, by the end of autumn, by the end of autumn next year, they would have got nice and big like this. Okay, nice and big. All that you do is, and this is especially if you're in an area that gets frost, okay? Chop them down, cut them down to about that high, okay? Get a whole lot of bark, bark mulch, put it on top of them, and it protects them. When spring arrives, you open them up, and they'll carry on growing again. Hmm, you'll get more than six months out of them. But I, I love the little begonias. Um, the brown leaf can cope with a little bit more sun than the green leaf. Um, so brown leaf, more of a sunny spot, and the green leaf, more in a shaded spot. The trick with begonias, guys, because a lot of us overwater them. And this is with any begonia as a rule of thumb. Do not overwater. Allow the plant to dry out completely. Stick your finger in the soil. Check your finger, okay? If it comes out with some soil attached to it, look here, look here, kijk hier, there. See? Soil on my finger. If it comes out with soil on your finger, you do not water. Please. It's so important because begonias, and you know what the problem is? We see like they, they start shrinking, like before our eyes, and they start getting smaller and smaller and smaller until there's nothing left. Begonias need to dry out, which is probably why you've killed one of those begonias that you got given as a nice little indoor patio plant. You know those ones with the big leaves, big voluptuous flowers? You probably killed it with kindness. So be a bit extra firm on them and be firmer with yourself. Let them dry out completely. Do the finger test. If the soil is dry, if your finger comes out with any no soil attached, you know the soil is dry. Okay, then you can water them. Very, very important with begonias. And why am I saying this? Well, the reason why they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and almost start imploding is because they actually start getting downy mildew. Downy mildew, powdery mildew, and that just makes the leaves drop and they also get a root disease. Mm, not pretty, not pretty at all. Okay, for the sun, for the sun, we've got glorious options. Okay, now for me, I want you just to look at that. Just that there. Isn't that beautiful? This is a little dwarf zinnia. Now they come in all these different colors separately. You can, you can get them in separate trays or you can get them, this little smarty box looks, look here. Um, this is called neon. Um, I love it. I just love it. And the way it pops in the flower beds, it, it's quite insane. Um, this, which is called rose, this is neon rose, is also spectacular. And I saw a pink. I saw pink, 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 pink. I don't have an Afrikaans word for further in pink, but it's pink. Um, I, I love them. And you also get them in the doubles. So keep an eye out at your local builders because you will find these amazing, super vibrant, incredibly tough plants. Now, with these, um, these little zinnias, they only get to about 25 to 30 centimeters, maximum height. They're really good in pots, um, great for fillers, and one plant, don't overplant, one plant. So this little guy over here, if I had to take this little guy and plant it, that little guy, okay, is going to cover that amount of space. So he's going to get at least three times his size. Okay, three times. Not necessarily in height, but in width. So make sure to give them a bit of space. Um, it, and, and tough, absolutely tough. And how do we know this? How do we know this? Because, listen up here. Can you hear that on the leaves? If you hear that, let's bring it a bit closer. What it is, is the little hairs. These are the little hairs on the zinnia leaves. And we've heard this before, and I've told you before, that if you get hairs on the leaves, hairs or square stems, hairs, square stems, and gray leaves tells you 
it's tough. It tells you that it doesn't need a lot of water because the hairs work at reflecting the sun's rays here. The hairs also help that when they do get a few water droplets on them, they hold them, they trap them. And then those water droplets will then fall to the ground. And then it's got a bit of moisture. Square stems, let's talk about square stems because those are normally part of the salvia family. Let's have a look. Have we got a square stem here? Oh yes, we have. Let's show you. So anything with square stems, and here it is. There it is right there. Square stems, tough, tough. That's your rule. That is your rule. So run around and feel the stems. Feel the stems. If it's square, you know it's tough. What falls into that category? Well, salvias from this little bedding, which I love this mix. Creams and these beautiful maroons. Great for hot, hot, sunny spots. And if you treat them well, when they get a bit scraggly, you prune them hard. Prune them hard, give them a good feeding of organic fertilizer and mulch and mulch and mulch. By goodness, they will come away again and just keep giving and keep giving. Okay, so, so these guys, well, I think they're really fab. Um, I know that last summer we used this. We used this mix um, in some of the front beds. And my goodness, it really did just jump. Um, some other ones that I want to show you, some, some other options, okay? Because there's lots, guys. There is lots, lots, lots. Um, and for me, for me, for me, you know, come on. Some of you don't like these, but Ayala Stiprach, they're gorgeous. They've been bred through natural selection. They've been worked on. These just scream summer fun, okay? That's, of course, your marigolds. And if you don't want to buy them in punnets, throw some seed. Come on, guys. They're so easy. Um, your marigolds are super, super easy to sow. The seed is big. And do I have a packet of marigolds here? I do, I do, I do. Look here. Look at that, but I mean, look at that color. Look at that color with that beautiful deep red on the inside. Come on now, that's a winner. I like that. Hmm. Yeah, I think it might be going in the garden. Ah, quite fun. All righty. Portulaca. Okay, Portulaca with these vibrant, almost fahy like flowers. This is an annual. Uh, really good for hot hanging baskets. So you've got a hanging basket next to a wall. Everything you put in there kind of just keels over and fracks. Then you plant some of these in there because they'll actually trail off the hanging basket and do a really good job. Low areas next to walls, climbing over, they work brilliantly. Also in great vibrant colors. So I'm like, I think I've given you the whole rainbow here. And then, of course, celosias. Celosias, oh, they're very feathery. Very, very feathery. Um, they remind me of Mitchell Park when I was growing up because there would be beds of celosia being grown at Mitchell Park. And, and um, our granny used to take us there to go and show us the birds. The birds were very big. They used to scare us most of the time. But anyway, and there used to be some big tortoises there. But I do remember the celosias, which are these, and these big winding beds almost like racetracks of color, uh, really spectacular. And of course, these little guys, the Taurinias, um, also these are full sun or semi-shade guys, full sun or semi-shade, nice, short and globular, and, and really quite fun to use. They come in a bright pink, um, in a white, a pale pink, and then this lovely purple. Quite fun, hey? So if I'm showing you some fun pots that you could go with, Hmm, here we go. It's quite a nice combo. That's quite a nice combo for you. And I would even go so far as to say, if you pop the cream in there with these in the foreground, you've got some nice things to work with. Some really nice things to work with. Okay, so let's get these out the way. Let's get them out the way. All righty. So that's kind of looking after your color, isn't it? Um, that's all your color. And whether it's going to be for pots, hanging baskets, we know you've got it, okay? We know you've got that covered. Now, let's go into some other things. What about, what about my shrubs or the middle, the in-between things, the things that I want to use that I know I'm going to plant and they're going to give me good legs and good length, okay? So, 
um, these plants have recently been introduced. And when I say recently, they, were, they have been bred. Um, we know this plant. We know this. These are scaviolas, okay? Um, the one we used to be known as Purple Fanfare. Uh, they're beautiful new varieties. This one's called Touch of Indigo. This purple one over here. Um, and this one is Bondi Blue. <gasps> but isn't it beautiful? Isn't that spectacular? Well, I couldn't resist some the other day. I got them, I put them in the wall garden, I put them just above the wall so that they're gonna cascade down. I had ideas of hanging baskets, window boxes, um, and I just love this. I mean, this is spectacular. But then I thought, ooh, but I don't have more space. So I pulled something out and I did this. True story, I planted that in the garden bed, just in the front, and behind it, I planted this. Oh, caramba. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Look at that combination. Look at that. Look at those colors. It's soft. It's gentle. It's summer. It's, it just works for me. Um, the scaviola loves full sun, really loves full sun. Um, I love that it's quite pale and gentle because just behind it, I've got a bright purple salvia that is screaming at me at the moment. So I popped in this wonderful inca lily, um, and this inca lily is part of the summer series. So when you go to your local builders, don't get confused because they're different types, guys. This one, you can see. Look at him. He's a dwergie. Okay? He is compact, smaller. So there are different varieties. The one that's called um, Enchanga, Enchanka, I think that's what it's called, Encarta. No, that's the Freedom Party. Oh, dear. Um, pff, what's it called? Encancha. Intercancha. Intercancha. Okay, it's compact. <laughs> so don't get confused. If you're wanting those for picking, don't get it mixed up. However, 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 this one, which is the dwarf one, because I had a lady shout at me the other day. Oh, really, she shouted at me. She was telling me that she bought five Inca lilies and she's been trying to use them for arranging, flower arranging. And, um, and, and she, she said that the stems aren't long enough. They all short like this. And I'm like, okay, well, do you remember the name, the label? Anyway, it turned out um, that, yep, uh, she had uh, bought the wrong plant. So certainly compact, yes, if you're wanting for smaller gardens or in a container, these ones work very, very nicely. But if you're wanting a bit of height in your garden beds, mid, and I'm talking this is mid garden bed, then definitely go with the summer series. Now remember, and I'm going to show you quickly. I'm going to put this on the floor. So Mason's going to come along with me. Um, oh, but, oh, okay. So, and I also want to show you this one here. I mean, isn't this beautiful? Look at that color. Isn't that color a riot? That's fantastic. It's also one of the summers. Um, but if I had to do a bit of a, of a combo here and stay there, and if I did, Put that over there. Now you can see it. Now you're looking down on it. Um, so you're looking down on that. Look at that color combination. That works for me. Also, if you were thinking of then adding in a bit of pop of color, there we go. Now we've got some combos. We've got the brightness of the marigold, we've got the scaviola, and then we've got this, which is the beautiful summer. Uh, I don't think you could go wrong. I honestly don't think you could. You could, but remember with the Inca lilies, remember with the Inca lilies, you never cut them. You never cut them with your secateur if you're picking them for the vase. You never do that. What you do is you go up to the plant, okay, and you grab it, and you grab it down here, and all you do is give it a, a yank. There it is. Okay, and out it comes. So, because there's a bulb in here, the, the, the inca lilies have a bulb, so as we snap it, 
We've snapped it off the bulb, which means that that bulb is now going to send off another shoot. Um, for the vase, strip it, all right, give it a little cut to neaten it off. And remember, if you want your plants to last longer in the vase, I'm told that a shot of vodka does the trick. A little shot of vodka, um, not for you, not for you, for the vase. So you add a little shot of vodka into your water and, um, and that keeps your flowers going longer. But oh, look at that. I mean, come on, guys. I, I, I just, I love it. I'm mesmerized by it. And uh, I truly can't believe the beauty of this. The great news as well is that both of these, the Inca lily and the Alstroemeria, are incredibly water-wise, tough individuals. They do not need a lot of water. They love the full sun. So for me, that's a go-to. Well, in fact, they're already in the garden. Um, and maybe these are going in as well. You just never know. All right, guys, um, where was I? Where was I? Oh, I'm talking combinations and plants, and there are actually so many that I'm getting quite excited. But anyway, I'm going to quickly show you this over here. Um, because a lot of our annuals, I mean, beg your pardon, a lot of our perennials, we've got in the garden. They're busy doing their thing. Um, and... Are we necessarily looking after them right? Are they still giving us the joy that we want? Um, and I'm going to show you a few combinations here and a few plants that I really would like to recommend to you um, to use in your summer garden. So the one is this. It's called Altananthera Purple Prince. Look at that foliage. Isn't it spectacular? And I want to grab one other thing because I want to show you what happens when you think about out the box. Oh, isn't it lovely? <laughs> so maybe this in a pot and with some of these beautiful little zinnias around it. I'm thinking that's a gorgeous combo. Altananthras, cheap as chips tough as nails, when they start getting a bit leggy, okay, a bit leggy, you get your secateur, you think of the worst boss you ever had, and you prune it hard. And I mean really hard. Prune it hard, the harder you prune it, the better it comes away. This is not one of those plants that you've got to be nervous of to prune, because when you've pruned it, you just encourage this beautiful new foliage to come through. Next to it is another stalwart. This is called Evolvulus. And it's called Blew My Mind. Blew My Mind. Um, now, a lot of us know the Evolvulus, the old-fashioned one. Well, it's not even old-fashioned. You'll find it's still available all over. But look out for this one, which is called Blew My Mind. Um, it's more compact. It's beautiful. It flowers more often. And it's also got, oh, funny that, hairs on its leaves. Funny that. So is this plant, also got hairs on its leaves, which is telling us it's tough as nails. Gaura or Gora as we know it. I mean, this is a stalwart in anybody's garden. This one's known as Belize, Belize dark pink. Now remember with your Goras, guys, they attract butterflies. Butterflies love them. The bees are going to go bazonkers over them, seriously. But what happens is sometimes, and it's not actually sometimes, it just happens. Because the goras are growing. They're obviously growing at a rate of knots because it's a great perennial. It really is a good perennial. Grows fast, great in combining with roses, mixed flower borders. But then it starts doing that. It starts opening up in the middle and on fale uur. Okay, you, you've seen that. And then the inside is all naked. All right, when that happens with the plant, the plant is telling you, please come and prune me, okay? When the plant has fallen open like this and you're looking into the doldrums of the base of the plant and it is naked, it is telling you it needs a prune. So then get out your trusted secateurs and prune it down, removing two-thirds, leaving one-third. Do you see this? removing two-thirds, leaving one-third. And in no time at all, within two to three weeks, this plant 
would have jumped back again in a flash and will give you another flush for the rest of the summer. So these plants do know what they're doing. Um, I think just sometimes they need to have flashcards in front of them so that uh, we can say, prune me, prune me, prune me. But however, if you read that really good gardening magazine that you can pick up at your local builders, which is called The Gardener or Detainee, believe it or not, every month we tell you what you should be pruning and not be pruning. So that's your backstop. Okay. Guys, we all know that water is an issue. Water is an issue wherever we are, whether you're in the Eastern Cape, whether you're in KZN, because our tanks certainly are not full. And now in Johannesburg. Um, Folks, I, I want you to have a look at the following video um, that we have uh, selected for you. Please take some notes um, because it is going to help you in the next few months, especially to continue gardening and to make the most of what we have. In gardening, there are many commodities that we are needing. Skills, tools, but most importantly, water. In this video, I'm going to share with you my favorite and most important water-wise gardening tips and skills to turn you into a better gardener. An important aspect of gardening and how we plant to prevent the amount of water that our plants use is what we call plant grouping. Now, there are various ways that we talk about this. Number one is that we plant plants together that have similar water requirements. So you wouldn't plant a plant such as an arum lily, which does require high amounts of water, next to a salvia, which is a great water-wise plant because it doesn't require that much water. Therefore, when to water one plant on its own next to a plant that has high water requirements simply is a waste of time, effort, energy, and water. So, there are two aspects to it. Number one is group the same plant together in large quantities. And when we talk about that and don't say, oh, but I've only got a small garden, that's fine. Three suffices for that. Three plants of the same type grouped together. And in gardening, we like to work in odd numbers. So threes, fives, sevens, nines, thirteens all work beautifully. And they give us that cluster that we're looking for. So not only does it have that impact that we want, but also we're putting the same plant together that has the same water requirements, which means that watering and maintenance becomes that much easier. We all know that certain lawns are water guzzlers. And in terms of that, I would strongly recommend that you rather go with an indigenous lawn that you're gonna choose for your garden. When we're looking at lawns as well, this is so important. I want you to get rid of unnecessary bits of lawn. So how do you identify that? Well, I'm gonna pose this to you and challenge you on this. Do you have areas where it's difficult to get your lawn mower to? If it's difficult to get your lawn mower to, get rid of it. It's a waste of time and energy and water. This section of the garden that I'm showing you right now was a narrow thoroughfare and I was always fighting to keep the lawn alive. So be brave enough and take it out. A great water-wise tip is to always keep your mowing height slightly higher and that way you're reducing the amount of stress that the lawn is under plus you are then helping to even control the weeds. That way you are going to have to water your lawn less, saving a whole lot. One of the most practical ways of saving water is to simply catch the water and that's called water harvesting. Folks, there are so many amazing videos, educational and tutorials and how-tos on the Builders YouTube channel on how to install rainwater tanks and how to harvest water. Behind this beautiful wall, which has now become a feature, is a water tank which takes the water off the roof of this garage, stores it, and when we need it, a simple Jojo pump is put there and we then use it back into the garden. One might also consider installing an irrigation system. Irrigation systems do save you money and time in the long run, and there are huge advantages to it. In fact, there are great clips on the Builders YouTube channel of how to install and what to use. When talking about watering, the timing of watering in your garden is critical. Never water during the heat of the day because that is when plants are at their best and highest for transpiration. In other words, everything that's been taken up in the roots 
is being expelled out through the leaves. The plant simply just can't cope and it's wasting water. So therefore your watering window is before sunrise and preferably before nine o'clock in the morning and then late afternoons. That's the best time to water, to conserve as much as possible. And one of the best ways of conserving water is a simple gardening activity that might cost you or might not. And that, my friends, is called mulching. Now, mulching is a term that is described as using an organic or inorganic material to cover the surface of bare soil. Now, you think about the soil is open to the elements, the sun bakes down and absorbs most of the moisture that there should be. So by placing a layer of organic or inorganic material on top of your soil, which is called mulching, will save you loads of water. Not only that, it's a great garden practice to also reduce the amount of weeds. It finishes off your garden and gives you that beautiful, even consistency. So let's take a whiz through some of the mulches that we prefer. We touched on gravel a little bit earlier. Now these can be used either in larger quantities over areas, or they can be used in smaller areas around pots. They work the same and they do exactly the same form of mulching. This over here is pine bark. Now for those of you that, that don't enjoy the messy look in terms of mulching, this is what I generally recommend folks to go for. Um, and this is pine bark, which is in large chips, and it does decompose after time, but when it does decompose, what it is doing is adding good organic content back into your soil. Macadamia nut shells or peanut shells also do a great job, very hard wearing and take a very long, long time to break down and end up into the soil. And of course, then you would simply just replace it. Remember, never fear when we are placing down mulch that it gets gobbled up into the soil because in that way, you're simply adding good humic content back into your soil. Finally, my favorites, and these are the ones that don't cost you a thing. Now, this over here is compost. A good layer, two to three centimeters around your bare patches of soil, around your plants that are establishing, or established plants always does the trick. However, this over here is our homemade compost. And in our homemade compost, you can see it's still breaking down here, but we've got the leaves, ah, and we've always got a few little surprises with some beautiful earthworms, which means that this is living and this is wonderful. This over here is leaf mold. And if you want to know what leaf mold is, guys, check out the YouTube channel because this is the easiest stuff to make and it is gold for your garden and great to use as a potting soil as well as a mulch. And finally, lawn clippings. As long as your lawn does not have weeds in it or if you mow your lawn before the weeds actually seed, then by all means, take the lawn clippings and use those as a mulch across your surface. They will not remove all the nitrogen from your soil. They will not infect and colonize your garden with strange things coming up at all. Those are simply old wives' tales. Then there's Hydrocash, which is a relatively new product, which is a water retaining gel, which you can simply add to your soil, hanging baskets, pots and containers, and to difficult areas in the garden, which helps retain water. Well, folks, here we've given you several tips on how to save water. It really is a paradigm shift to the natural and way that we might have gardened in the past, but it is the right move. Try it one step at a time. Embrace one aspect of what we've spoken about and one small change can make a huge difference. Remember for more videos like this and how to's to check out the Builders website and blog and also their YouTube channel where there are loads of other ideas to turn you into better DIYer and a greater gardener. Remember you can shop gardening supplies either in store or online. Get to Builders and get it done. Alrighty folks, so your to-do list has got very, very long. I know that even for the lady who lives in America, you that lives in the desert, um, you can still follow these gardening practices and you can still actually have a good garden. So, okay. Um, as we say in Afrikaans, um, and this is for you to go and put into Google Translate, uh, we have a lovely saying in South Africa, that is true to the essence of all Africans, 
and we say a boer maka plan. What does that mean? We make a plan, but you can also put it into your Google Translate. Right. Okay, guys, the rest of summer, what else do we do now? So if you're walking around your builders and you come across some of these things, okay, some of these things, and they look all bit shriveled up and strange, well, never fear, because this is what you should be doing with them. It's summer bulb time. It's summer bulb time. I mean, look at this beauty here. Look at this amaryllis. We planted this baby about four weeks ago. Four weeks ago, three in this little terracotta pot with a bit of well-drained potting soil. And all it needs is water. It needs water and sun. And look at this color. This is called Sonatina Lemon Sorbet. Oh, and it's yummy, isn't it? And I know that when I've got this guy now, look, he's starting to push up leaves. There we go. The leaves are starting to push up. That once it's finished flowering, all right, I do know that next year I'm going to have more and more and more because that's what bulbs do for you. And especially the summer bulbs because they are more suited to our South African climate. So dahlias, guys, dahlias. Whether you call them dahlias, dinner plates, or just dahlias. Find the one that suits your garden space. Whether it's the little, little compact pom-poms, or whether it's the big, large dinner plates. Um, they can go in pots, they can go in your borders. You can have them deep in the back of your flower beds. But these guys, talk about giving, talk about giving, are insane. A um, couple of tips I want to give you when you are digging the planting hole, and that's if you have failed, of course, to read the instructions, which are, of course, on the back. But never mind that, I'm going to tell you about it in any case. When you're dealing with your, your dahlias, a big hole, guys, a really good big hole. And I'm talking 30 by 30, okay? Large amounts of compost in there. And then I want you to add a handful of 232 or a handful of organic fertilizer. All right, handful inside there. Then you fill it up and then you water it. And you water it once a week, a deep watering. Now, not this pss, 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 I mean a deep, gentle soaking, okay? Let the water get all the way down to the growing points of the bulbs, okay? And what's gonna happen is, as they are starting to grow and their roots start get being sent out, well, they're drawing all this good nutrition. They're drawing it. And, and guys, we have had dahlias in the garden for years. And man, I get super excited and quite impatient as to when to put them in. But you can put them in any time now until the end of November. You can even plant them in December if you want. Um, because they will go right through until April, May, depending on when your first frosts arrive in your region. Um, but cut flowers floating in a vase even, just beauty in the garden. You, you, you cannot, there is very little um, that can compare to this, very, very little. Now I hear some of you sitting there and drumming your fingers on, um, on your computer or mumbling to yourself, but I've got, I've got molds. Okay, okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. I got this, because I've also got molds. We have got molds that them and the entire family and the furthest generation have moved into our garden. True story. So I was like, okay guys, you wanna play ball? Here it comes. So when I'm gonna be planting my dahlias in the beds this season, I'm gonna be planting them in some big 30 by 30 plastic pots. Of course, any form of receptacle, it could be an old bucket, it could be anything, as long as it's got some holes, okay, as long as it's got some drainage holes, very, very important. But you're going to follow exactly the same procedure, and you're going to take your bulb, and you're going to plant it in the pot, okay, and then the mirrors, the mirrors can't get there. All right, that's one option, that is one option. The other option, and guys, I didn't really, I tried this I tried this gadget a long time ago, and in fact, where's its box? Where did I put its box? Um, oh, right here. So I tried this a long, long time ago, and maybe I wasn't using it properly, and, and I, I tried it, and I thought, oh, come on. 
for me it didn't work. But maybe things have improved, maybe this is, and it is a different, a different make, a different supplier. So um, the other day I was besides, I was to the end of my wits, you know, I, I, it, you know it gets bad. You know it gets bad when you want to take the hose pipe and stick the hose pipe down the hole and drown it. You know it gets bad when you want to run out and find a double barrel, how's your father, something, and go... <coughs> okay, but we all know that we're not allowed to do these things. Um, we're only allowed to up our medication. However, when I was in my local builders, I saw these guys and I thought, right, I bought one. I bought one, okay? And then at the same time, I got myself some of these recycled or these rechargeable batteries. I was fascinated at it because it takes this big guy and look, this little wee little thing fits in there and then you've got a bigger battery. Fascinating, fascinating. Anyway, so I got this and then this is how this thing works. You can see it's well used. Nah, you can see it's well used. Anyway, what happens is as follows. You just stick the batteries in here. Okay, stick the batteries in, wrong way around. Uh, that way, that's the way they go. Pop them in. Okay. Oh, oh caramba! Oh, oh, your mouth. Okay. Pop the lid on. And it's orange so that you don't put the lawnmower over it. Now, you, you heard when I started it, and I'm actually just going to leave it on the counter here, because every 20 or 30 seconds, this thing vibrates like... <laughs> it actually fell off the kitchen counter the first time I put the batteries in it because I left it. And I'm like, whoa! Um, but it works. What you do is, and the critical point is as follows, is that you've got to bury the guy as far up to this orange. Do you see this orange here? You've got to bury it into the soil really deep down. So, and I know it's quite difficult. I tried pushing this thing into the lawn. Well, I nearly broke my back. So what you do is just get, um, get a pole, uh, get a hammer, knock the, 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 the pole into the soil, jiggle it around a bit so you've got a nice long um, shaft that you can then put this guy into, okay? Um, and then it does its job. It does its job. The dogs, of course, thought it was hysterical. The dogs were like, there. Ooh. Did you see it? Did you see that? Now imagine if you, a cute little mole cruising around, around, about to chomp my dahlia, and this thing happens. This is like an earthquake on the Richter scale of 9.2. Hulle gaan weg, hardloop. Yeah, now, the, now your beer months attain to. Okay, so guys, has it worked? Yes. How many do I now own? Five. <laughs> True story. True story. Um, and, and I mean, it's, it's hysterical when you, you're walking around the garden late afternoon, you know, the summers are beautiful now. And I'd, I normally pour myself an Oros. Yes, no. And uh, walk through the garden just to, you know, you get to enjoy it and just take it in and you're walking past and it's beautiful and quiet and you're next to you. But anyway, guys, the bottom line is it works. Um, it can deal with an area um, of up to 200 square meters. So that's big, hey? Of course, I just did overkill. I put five in the front lawn. Um, uh, 200 squares, sun, rain. I, oh, I, I just, just, oh, this thing is making me nervous. I'm just going to quieten, quieten, quieten her down. Okay, just going to take batteries out. <laughs> For those of you who think it doesn't work, I are telling you it does. I are telling you. Um, okay, guys, I believe there's some questions. So let's get to the queue and, and unlock myself out my own computer. And let's have a look at the questions that we've got coming through. Right. Um, hmm. Ah, there they are. Right. Uh, Chantelle wants to know, any plants or flowers that you can recommend in 100% full shade? 100%. Chantelle, lots. When you talk 100% full shade, I assume this is under a tree. Okay. Um, if you can give us a bit more feed, a bit more information on this, if it's under a tree or if it's maybe near the side of the, of the house, because there are going to be, well, in fact, I'm going to give, okay, I'm going to give you the good or general 
um, explanation. Chantal, whether it's under a tree, whether it's the side of the house that's giving you this full shade, I need you to apply the following, and this is very important. You've got to do some hard work. You've got to get in loads of compost into that soil. You've got to put in loads of bone meal, good organic fertilizer, because if it's under a tree or next to the side of the house, you'll probably find that the soil is very, very poor. The problem is with under trees is that the plants that you plant start competing for nutrition and moisture as do the, tr the, the roots of the trees. Okay, so it's this continual fight and you end up watering, watering, watering. So what I want you to do if it is under trees is the following. Dig out a big basin, okay, like a big basin. Get rid of that soil, soil, hoi that soil away. Then I want you to get some thick black plastic, like builder's plastic from your local builders. It, it comes in sheets. Put that down, all right? Poke a few holes in it. Fill it back up with good compost with your bone meal and all of that. Right, in there. Then you plant. And the plants that you're going to use are as follows. Here are some ideas. Dietes work brilliantly. Plectranthus, whether it's the big guy or the small little guy, are fantastic. Fuchsias, fuchsias that will give you beautiful flowers. Variegated little plectranthus that give you that pop of color. Clivias, love the shade. The deeper the shade, the better. Um, I think there are five or six that I've just given you. If you need more, um, please let us know and we can give you some more ideas. Um, right. Um, oh, I'm about to do something terrible on my computer. Uh, uh, oh, Chantel says, okay. Chantel says, small garden next to a wall. It's a new garden. Right. Okay. If it's a new garden and it's next to a wall, uh, Chantel, I promise you that soil is going to be awful, awful. So dig in lots of compost, follow what I've said to you. Um, and those plants that I've mentioned, they will be rock stars in there. I promise you that. Um, uh, Shakira, um, hi there fellow gardeners, Tanya. I have an east facing section at the back of our house, which gets almost full sun um, in the dry summer and almost full shade in the wet winter. What could I plant here? Ah, so those plants that I have just mentioned, except the clivias. The clivias, in fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, hold on. Uh, do, 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 do. No, okay, negative, remove the clivias from that. Right, these are some plants that you could plant there that will do exceptionally well. Camellias, camellias are beautiful. It's a large shrub, which you can also prune and keep nice and low. They get flowers, yo big, or as little as my thumb. They're called camellias or camellia. Um, look them up, find them at your local builders. They can grow in sun or shade. Um, you can clip them, you can make little hedges out of them. Fantastic. The other plants that will cope beautifully there are agapanthus. Agapanthus can be in that full sun or even in the shade. They'd be very happy either way. Um, of course, the dietes that I mentioned and the plectranthus will be fine as well as this plant over here which is a beautiful formium. This is a formium called yellow wave. Now, many of the formiums enjoy and prefer full sun, but this one called yellow wave can actually grow in a lot of shade, full shade, or in the full sun. Also keep an eye out for smaller grasses, like all your carex. Your carex varieties, which only get this big, you get little green, and, and yellow striped ones, um, they will be 100% happy in that. And as will um, the other name that I'm trying to think of, Carex and Ophiopogons. Um, all of your Ophiopogons will do exceptionally well in that spot, really well. Okay, worms eating my clivia plants every year. Indira, 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 it's you, Indira, Indira, it's you, hello. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you the following to try. Um, right. So, um, there are, can I have a complete, please? There are various ways of dealing with these. Now, number one, your powers of observation are very, very important, are very important. Because what happens is those eggs are then laid, and as soon as those eggs hatch, if you do not pay careful attention and watch, see those caterpillars, by the time you next notice is when they have bored all the way down into your clivia, your agapanthus, your amaryllis, 
And what happens? It gets into the bulb and it destroys it. It destroys the bulb. Okay, so there are two ways, three ways of dealing with it, guys. This over here is called Lava Pro. It's from EcoBuzz and you can pick it up at your local builders near the seed section. Um, there are three sachets in here. Um, you die, give me the complete, please. Thank you. What you do is you dilute this into five liters of water and you will spray it onto the said caterpillars. So you spray it onto them. The same you do with this, Margaret Roberts Biological Caterpillar Insecticide. What it does is it actually gives the caterpillars a really bad tummy ache, a really, really bad tummy ache, so much so that they stop eating. And in three to four days, the caterpillars fall off the plant. And even if your grandchild eats the caterpillar or the dog or you, Nothing will happen because the caterpillar has simply just died of starvation. It is not a chemical. It's actually a type of bacteria that is then put in. It slits its gut. It's so terrible. But anyway, just, just all you need to worry about is that it's not a chemical. This is not a chemical that is used here in either one of these. For four times a year treating, you can use Complete 350. It's an imicloprid. It's a suspension. Basically, what does that mean is you take small amounts, you get given a little syringe in this with this bottle, small amounts, diluted into five liters of water, and you water around the plant. So you actually let this soak into the soil. Okay, important. Let it soak into the soil. Once you've done that, the following day, I want you to water that plant really well um, so that you soak that soil and it goes further into it. What happens is because this is a systemic, it's like an antibiotic. It gets taken up through the roots into the plant and when said caterpillar comes along to go munch, it falls off. Okay, and she are dead. Okay, three ways of dealing with it. All right, we've got another question here. Um, my avo tree is full of flowers and some small pears. Very, very good. But there's wasps and bumblebees on the flowers. Hi, Bowena. Rada, Rada, no, that's very good because they're pollinating. The bumblebees and the wasps actually are great pollinators. So don't worry about that. The wasps are not going to sting the fruit. The bumblebees are simply like enjoying the mass of pollen that's there. Um, and they're helping to pollinate it. So the more of these good guys you actually have, the better. Because it means you're going to end up with more fruit. So don't worry about them. And trust me, bees, bumblebees, wasps are not going to fly from a beautiful flower full of pollen. Leave that flower and come and find you to sting you. They don't operate like that. Neither does nature. Unless you go and go and play in the flower and hit it or something, you're going to upset that guy like you'd upset me and I'd probably also turn around and hit you. Except I would hit you with the spade. So, so don't interfere with the bees, the wasps. They're doing their thing. They're pollinating. They're doing their job. Okay, so please don't stress about those, Rada. They're fine. In fact, you're blessed to have so much wildlife in your garden. Um, Amina. Amina wants to know, how do I treat mealy bugs on Kalanchoe? Right, Amina, there are some very, very quick ways um, of treating. Very, very quick ways. And the one, and I imagine this Kalanchoe is indoors, so I'd recommend that you get yourself a bottle of this from your local builders. It's called Garden Gun. It's already mixed. You don't need to worry about any dilution rates. All you do is you turn this little nozzle into the spray position and you just give it a pss, 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 pss. Okay, remember, mealybug takes quite a while to get rid of. All right, it really does. So one application once a week, spray it again next week, and then the following week, and you'll probably get rid of it. Okay. Uh, guys, those are all the questions that I have time to answer today, but do remember that I'm going to get back to you. Okay, so we will send you um, a message on Facebook to be able to answer your questions. Guys, remember, remember, there is loads of inspiration out there, loads of inspiration from yours truly and the amazing team. Um, and the great learners and, and people with knowledge and gardening um, that are in our magazines. If we had to add together all the years of, of um, expertise and gardening advice and knowledge that all the writers put together 
we'd probably hit over 500. Hmm, probably. Um, and that's all in here, ready for you. Of course, there's Grow to Eat, uh, which is available at your local builders. It's full of all the yummies. It's got three months in it, three months of all that you can do in the garden, okay? From strawberries to growing galangal to quinces to melons. Um, there is so much in your Grow to Eat magazine and plus, of course, all the yummy recipes that go with it. Your October issue of The Gardener is still out there with these beautiful voluptuous roses on it. Um, do make sure that you get it. There's edible perennials on there. Um, you have got loads on roses from containers to in the garden. Um, we're showing you how to build your own bee house. Um, and that's for solitary bees. So there's another one for you. And of course, all the other general info on what to do in the garden now. Come on, braai and let's braai. Your hiller is da for yiller. And don't you just want to eat those yummy prawns? Don't you just want to eat them? Um, it's summer. The evenings are gorgeous. Get all your inspiration that you need right here in Commons Braai and Let's Braai. Folks, remember, um, if you're wanting some more gardening inspiration or some DIYs and a few hints and tips, remember to head on over to the Builder's blog because there's loads of info right there. Um, most importantly, to you and yours and from myself and this amazing team, um, which helped put together this live for you. God bless you all and happy gardening.